All right, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to uh, <clears throat> introduce this topic today on global health. Uh, I think we have a very interesting morning ahead of us. Um, this is program has been put together by uh, Dr. Helen Damaris. Uh, she's an associate professor and uh, the director of global health in the Department of Ophthalmology and Visit Sciences here. She's also cross appointed to the Division of Clinical Public Health, the Alana School of Public Health here in Toronto. She's the director of global eye health research in our department and at the Hospital for Sick Children. And she's a scientist in the Child Health Evaluative Sciences Program and Center for Global Health Child in the Sick Kids Research Institute. She completed a PhD in molecular and medical, and medical genetics and postdoctoral training in clinical trials and global health. Her work has contributed to the understanding of the molecular genetic development of the childhood eye cancer, retinoblastoma. She leads a research program that lies at the intersection of global health cancer genetics, and patient engagement. Much of her work is focused on how to deliver optimal retinoblastoma care worldwide and improve patient outcomes with patients as partners in these efforts. So welcome Dr. Damaris and your panel today. Thank you very much. Thanks very much for that introduction. Although the focus today is not me, but our partners from um, all over the world. And we're gonna be talking about academic partnerships in global ophthalmology. I'll give a short introduction and then hand it over to our expert panelists. I'll just give you a brief um, agenda for what we're going to talk about in these first few minutes. I'd like to cover the definition of global health and principles for global health as uh, a centering uh, exercise for us to understand what exactly it is we are talking about when we refer to global health and in particular global ophthalmology. And then I'll hand it over to our panelists who I'll introduce in just a moment to tell us about their own projects in uh, achieving health equity in ophthalmology in their context. And then we'll have a discussion on how the University of Toronto can support these projects um, through these partnerships between our institutions. Um, the definition of global health uh, you may be familiar with is that it's an area for study, research, and practice that places a priority on improving health and achieving equity and health for all people worldwide. So this focus on health equity and um, eliminating avoidable factors that cause good health in some contexts and poor health in others is really the focus of activity in this area. And so in order to achieve health equity, uh, the global health definition actually goes further to talk about how uh, cooperation globally is important in solving global health challenges because they are so complex and that any solutions really require interdisciplinary support, whether that be through study, research or practice. Many of you may be aware that uh, recently the Global um, Commission for Global Eye Health published a report in the Lancet Global Health that frames global ophthalmology and global eye health as an important um, feature of achieving sustainable development worldwide. And they really focus on the need for more study to identify um, missing data in global eye health, um, and, and need for more research to come up with innovations that help achieve global health equity in this area, and a need for practice and quality eye care. And so a lot of capacity building as well to ensure that not just our eye health services available, but they're accessible to all. And several of our panelists today were part of this commission and continue to do the important work to achieve these goals. For us here in Canada, um, we have some guiding principles when partnering on international and global projects. And these here are the principles for global health research. However, I feel they are um, essential and, and applicable to partnerships in global health in general, not just um, the research aspect. And so it's important for us academics to consider our activities in global health um, through the lens of these, um, these ethical issues. So one, how are we coming to this partnership? what's informing the way we've partnered with our other individuals and assessing equity in how we're managing our roles and responsibilities. Um, who's included in our partnership activities? So how do our practices actually promote uh, and, and involve participants from uh, individuals who might be historically marginalized? When we're act actively working in the global health arena, how is each partner benefiting from this research or this activity? And how do we share these benefits, whether that's the, um, 
the, the results of a project, publication, or other intellectual property rights. It's important too that global health activities have this commitment to the future. So it's not a one-off, but we are actually committed to um, continuing our work in the long term. And I think academic institutions are uniquely placed to um, commit to the future and participate in these long-term um, activities. And ideally we're centering our activities around the root causes of inequity. So we're not just treating the symptom of the health inequity, but what's truly at the cause. And this is where research and scholarship has um, a great role to play. And finally, at the personal level, um, humility. As academics from the University of Toronto, we come from a very a privileged position in the world. And so we need to consider who we are in the context of our global health activities, how we're positioning ourselves in that partnership, and how we can really learn from our partners um, around the world, uh, recognize that this is a learning opportunity for us as well, and that we are um, not always there to lead, but also to, to follow and support um, in, in the individual activities. And so these are some principles for global health that we can consider as we learn from our panelists today about their, their activities, um, which have worked in partnership with many of us in the department and some um, with other partners around the world or not at all. And we can think about how we can continue to partner equitably and achieve those sustainable development goals in global eye health. That's it from me. And now we'll hear from our four panelists, starting with Dr. Lizette Mowat. Um, many of you may know her. She's a long standing partner um, of many of us here at the University of Toronto. She's a consultant ophthalmologist and senior lecturer at the Faculty of Medical Sciences at the University of the West Indies in Mona, Jamaica. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Sadiq Sharif, who's the chief of ophthalmology at Addis Ababa University in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, um, where he also leads the pediatric ophthalmology unit at Menelik uh, the Second Hospital. Um, next, we'll hear from Dr. Juliet Otiti, who's a professor at Makerere University in Kampala, Uganda, and an ophthalmologist in Lulango Hospital. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Vera Asuman, who's an associate professor and head of ophthalmology at the University of Ghana in Accra. She's also the head of the pediatric unit at the Lions International Eye Center at Korlebu Teaching Hospital in Accra, Ghana. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here today. Um, we'll start first with Dr. Moet. I will stop sharing my screen. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to um, Helen for the introduction and the invitation to present. My topic is really just going to talk about the academic partnership that I've had with University of Toronto. And um, I'm talking about it from the aspect of our residency program in Jamaica. So for those who may not know where Jamaica is, I've put up a global map to show where we are, which is this little small island in the Caribbean. We're actually, uh, let's make it a little bit bigger, the third largest island in the Caribbean. And if you look, the largest is Cuba, and then we have Haiti and Dominican Republic, but we are the largest English speaking island in the Caribbean. The University of the West Indies is actually based on three campuses for the Faculty of Medical Sciences for postgraduate degrees. And that's located in Jamaica and of just about a thousand miles over UC Barbados and Trinidad and Tobago. So the DM Ophthalmology Residency Program was started in Jamaica just about 17 years ago. It's a six year ophthalmology residency program fashioned after the UK where we had done, where I done my training. And it's divided between two hospitals in Jamaica. Uh, we have 14 residents in the program and we've had seven graduates to date. So the actual start of the links goes as far back as um, 2005, when we first met Dr. Sharif al -Difori. At that time, I believe he was in Kingston, Ontario, and he had made a visit to Jamaica with the Flying Eye Hospital, Orbis. And from there, we started discussions. We also found we had someone in common, Dr. Garth Taylor, who was also an ophthalmologist at Kingston, Ontario, 
and a Jamaican-born ophthalmologist also. Dr. Garth Taylor had done several missions with Orbis to Jamaica for several years before, and it was the first I was actually meeting Dr. Eldiford, but it certainly started us talking. Unfortunately, that year, um, Dr. Taylor had passed and his wife, Dr. Uh, Taylor's wife, Beverly Taylor, had wanted to donate part of Garth Taylor's library to the DM ophthalmology program, which was a significant benefit. So in 2006, I had traveled up to meet with Beverly Taylor and we had further discussions with Sharif Eldifrawi. When a program starts, uh, as we start in 2004, we really start with nothing. So when we had that donation of Dr. Garth Taylor's uh, library books, it made a huge plus to our program. And that kind of kicked off the start with the uh, partnership with Canada. Dr. Sharif Aldifori Kani consented to be our external examiner in our DM program, and he was external examiner between 2006, 2010, and we had our first graduate in 2010. During that time, he helped us form and improve on our exams, uh, the way we examined our, our candidates, both at the basic sciences level, the optics and refraction level, and also in the clinical level. We continued the partnership with um, Professor Martin Tenhove, who was also from Kingston, Ontario. And then we were happy to get Professor Eldi Fori back again in 2015 to 2020. And this year in 2021, we're looking forward to having Prof Salmovic being our external examiner for the DM program. So this has really helped to develop the program and also the assessment of the candidates so that we're fair and we're also delivering what would be international standards. I have to commend um, Je Jeff Hurwitz, who in um, 2007 started us allowing our residents to attend the TORIC course, and that has been a significant plus. And I put Dr. Garth Taylor's picture here because I believe that the, the first year or two, it was actually sponsored through the Garth Taylor Fund to allow that. And that was a significant plus because this course is about six weeks, so it is quite an expensive thing for our residents to travel to Canada to do. So we appreciate the funding with uh, the Garth Taylor Fund. Throughout the years, Sharif has been significant in terms of allowing us to uh, evolve our DM program. And we did a three-day workshop with all three islands, lecturers from all three islands and Sharif. Uh, really long hour shifts from 12 to 12. and we revamped the DM curriculum. I'm just showing you here with the arrows. We had lectures from Jamaica, three, three of us, three from Trinidad and two from Barbados. And we sat at the table at Mona in Jamaica and with the help of Professor Eldi Fawi, we looked at the international curricula and we looked at ours and looked at our learning outcomes and what we could standardize because a program should be delivered the same way in each island. So that was a huge plus for us in 2017. What has also made a difference is our collaboration with um, Orbis. So in 2018, we actually invited Orbis to come to Jamaica and having that partnership with Orbis, through which we also had with Professor Eldi Frawi, we were able to make significant changes to our department. Our department had stayed the same since the building was made in 20, um, 1950s. So we were able to revamp the clinic because this is our present our clinic then where you had the patient sitting beside the doctor and there was no privacy at the time. Now with the help of always coming, we have revamped our clinic. We have a perfectly refurbished clinic with the lanes that you have individual privacy. And this has significantly improved the morale of our doctors and also the privacy of our patients. And this would only have occurred with the partnerships that we've developed. With the Flying Eye Hospital, we also had training opportunities for our residents with life surgeries and simulation, and that made a significant impact on our residents. It stimulated them to, to want to do more. And of course, Prof. Elder Foy was there with them um, going through the, this is a picture of him going through the pre-op notes with our residents and our residents operating on the, the plane. What was a highlight of our partnership with the University of Toronto is in 2018, we collaborated with them through Dr. Eldi Frawi again to have eight of the faculty of the University of Toronto present at our eighth annual OSG meeting. And I really appreciate the input we got from Dr. Mooney, Dr. Bajak, Dr. Marvelin, Dr. Coley, Dr. Schlenner, 
uh, Dr. Gill and Dr. Ali. So this brought so much information to the conference and also it also helped to develop our residents because they were able to make contacts and networking with the visiting faculty. So the partnerships allow a great opportunity. It has allowed a residency ophthalmology program to develop. We actually did start clinical electives. Um, this was started with Barbados. Jamaica has not yet done. It's also given us a lot of opportunity for virtual teaching. Research is something that we have not explored too deeply, but exam assessment of our candidates have improved over the years through the guidance from the experience of Dr. Eldifrawi. We have developed our curriculum, revised it, improved it, grow our program, and it's also allowed our lecturers to grow. And what I'm really happy with is increased networking, particularly with the TORIC courses where our residents go overseas and they're able to interact with the other residents. We have spoken about possibly doing short electives where residents from Canada could always come down because pathologies are a little different in different areas of the country. So in terms of COVID, there have been pros and cons. There's been less face-to-face. -face. Um, unfortunately, our residents would not be able to attend TORIC this year. It had affected our DM examinations or postgraduate examinations. However, we're now learning to use Zoom to do virtual examinations. There have been less clinical elective opportunities as one would suspect with this pandemic. However, an excellent thing is that there are more online or virtual teaching with the University of Toronto via the Zoom link. So in the future, we hope to continue academic partnerships. We hope that we could exchange residents or continue doing electives. Uh, we look forward to the virtual meetings, the residents rounds and conferences and uh, continue discussion in how we can ensure a fair and robust program aiming for excellence with the help of our University of Toronto partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mowat. Uh, we'll leave the questions for the end um, and we'll take them for all panelists. Next, I'll invite Dr. Sadiq Sharif to share his presentation. As he's getting his talk up, I will just say that it's been a pleasure to have your residents at Torek. They're some of the most fun residents and everyone enjoys getting to, getting to know them. So it's, it's been an absolute pleasure having them and I look forward to having them next year. Yes, thanks, Sam. Uh, invitation. And uh, I'll be talking about the, uh, the TAC collaboration between the University of uh, Toronto and Addis Ababa University, uh, you know, that has been there for four years and how we exploit this uh, opportunity platform for, for us. So th this will be the, my uh, out outline of presentation. I will say something about the, our, our university, how the uh, connection was uh, started, what is TAC means and how the collaboration was uh, started and what was the purpose and challenge and the next steps. So to give a kind of background, Addis Ababa University, one of the oldest university in uh, in uh, in Africa, uh, of uh, seventy years, uh, uh, it was established by the Emperor Haile Selassie, and uh, you know the collaboration between Canada and Ethiopia was sta started when uh, Addis Ababa University was established. The first uh, uh, president was uh, Dr. Lucy Matt, who is a Kennedy and Jusit, uh, who was the first president in 1961. Uh, 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 right now, we have 12 campuses, more than, uh, so far, more than uh, 250,000 students graduated. Uh, 60,000 students are in training. So overall in the university, more than 70 programs, 225 undergraduates, 69 PhD programs, our College of Health Science, it is uh, located at, in Addis Ababa University. There are four schools. The School of uh, Medicine is one of one of the oldest in the School of, uh, uh, in the Addis Ababa University, which was established in 1961. So right now we have more than 5,000 students in the, in the School of Medicine, in the uh, College of Health Science, and over 1,000 staffs, uh, nine undergraduate programs, and more than 80 postgraduate clinical and non-clinical programs. Coming to my department, that's the first residency training program in Ethiopia, which was established in 1980, located at uh, Minilis II Hospital. 
Still, Minilik is the first hospital in Ethiopia, which was established in 1902. So far, uh, my department uh, trained uh, more than uh, you know, 150 ophthalmologists in Ethiopia, which is nearly more than 90% of the Ethiopian ophthalmologists. So we have this ophthalmology residency program, a four-year uh, residency program, and also uh, we started uh, glaucoma fellowship in collaboration with Alberta. So still Canada is in, uh, in, in, in place with, uh, with us in our department. And this year we started a sandwich fellowship in cornea and plastics in collaboration with the Himalayan cataract project. So here are the staffs in the department. We have two cornea surgeons, two glaucoma. Right now, when we start the collaboration, we were only two now two of my colleagues, they joined us. So we have four pediatric ophthalmologists. Uh, just to give you a kind of background, what the situation that we are in. Uh, uh, Ethiopia is one of uh, a country with huge burden of uh, uh, low vision in the blindness. We have an old data which was uh, conducted nearly 15 years ago. Prevalence of blindness is 1.5%, 1.6% and low vision 3.7%. So we have very, uh, for 110 million uh, population, only 165 ophthalmologists and 30 subspecialists. So uh, all over the country, we have 47 public secondary eye care units and five tertiary eye care centers with residency programs. So we have five residency programs. Coming to the child eye care in Ethiopia, uh, we have five pediatric eye, eye centers, I can say, only uh, the Addis Ababa University Center is a little bit, uh, you know, uh, well furnished. The others are in the process for uh, 110 million populations. And the prevalence of childhood blindness is 0.1%, uh, which is 6% of the total population of blindness. So uh, here are the challenges in uh, eye care in Ethiopia. So lack of trained human resources, poor eye care service systems, maldistributions of available health workers. 70% of the ophthalmologists that are practicing in Ethiopia, they reside in, in major cities like Addis Ababa, which is the capital city of uh, Ethiopia. Uh, there is a challenge in medical equipment and supplies, in accessibility of eye care services, mitigation of qualified health workers, low awareness of the society on eye health, absence of children eye screening are the main uh, challenge. In So how, how did everything start? Uh, working with uh, sick kids. So uh, I did my fellowship in Canada. I had a wonderful stay in 2015-2016. Uh, and then, you know, this is the thing that I learned during my stay. So uh, I was really lucky uh, to be, uh, you know, to get this uh, Eye Hero Award in 2018. And this was my quote for the Eye Hero Award. So I'm going to read it. During my fellowship in Toronto, I realized the value of individual contribution for best eye care service through investing on training, research, and eye care system. Through my reading and conversation with my esteemed mentors at UFT, it was not that long ago that Canada was also suffering from lack of eye care system. So one of the things that I learned besides you know, the actual uh, clinical uh, you know, things there is a possibility that if we work hard, if we can collaborate, so, you know, I can mention uh, Brenda Gali, how she worked in the past 30 something years on retinoblastoma. And she was telling me, you know, how, uh, you know, everything was changed in the past 30 something years. So that was a kind of aspirations. So what, you know, the things that I learned at the, at the C Kids one, everything has its, own, its uh, kind of standardization, be it the training, be the research service and everything, there are standard operating procedures which are in place and that thing, there are continuous areas of uh, improvement in teaching service and research. And most of, most of the, the staffs, be it the, the, the academics or uh, others, they have a kind of area for uh, specialization. So what did I, uh, what, what, what I wanted during my, my fellowships? Besides, as I said, you know, attending my fellowship, clinical and uh, clinical knowledge and skills, I had a dream 
to, to establish uh, you know, a pediatric ophthalmology fellowship program in, in my country from day one. So I wanted to learn everything. So I was documenting uh, experiences, best experiences. I was asking my mentors, you know, fortunately my mentors, they were really very nice, kind, you know, they were friendly and they, they shared all their, uh, what they had. And we had a platform between the University of Toronto and the Addis Ababa University. That's what we call TAC, Toronto Addis Ababa uh, Academy Collaboration. This TAC collaboration, uh, it was established in 2018 in when there was a collaboration between the Department of Psychiatry of UFT and AAU. So at that time in Ethiopia, there were only 11 psychiatrists in the country. The main challenge uh, you know, for, for specialty in, in psychiatry were the brain drain and relevance of the curriculum to the, the, to the existing uh, you know, uh, situation in Ethiopia. So Claire Penn and, uh, uh, and others from the, my college, my university, they established this collaboration. And this was a model of delivery of postgraduate medical training in residency and fellowship. So it had like three steps in global health collaboration. So there was a training program which was first developed, then graduates contribute to the curriculum delivery as a faculty. Those graduates at the same time programs are then sustainable and undergo periodic review. So staffs from, uh, uh, from Canada, they do a kind of visit for a month, two or something, and they teach their uh, residents. And these residents, they will be part of you know, the teaching process. So, so far through the TAC, 20 Ethiopian graduate programs are uh, running. 222 graduates are uh, trained. Over 90 of them, they remain in Ethiopia as a faculty. So one of the challenges, I mean, uh, during our discussion, you know, maybe we can discuss to build a sustainable uh, partnership program between high income countries and low income countries, a brain drain is, is one of the challenges. So we were able to, uh, 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 you know, keep our, our doctors in, in the country. And these doctors, now they are running this the program. So that was, that was a kind of platform that the, my department, Department of Ophthalmology in Addis and the uh, 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 University of Athikis, University of Toronto was. So what I was telling uh, 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 Dr. Ali, who is a very good friendly uh, mentor of, uh, of uh, mine, you know, during my stay, what, uh, what my dream and what my plan is. And to Helen, she's also a very good advocate for global health. And uh, so, you know, we got a grant and uh, they, uh, a team led by uh, Dr. Ali visited uh, the, my hospital in uh, 2018. And we did a situational analysis and need assessment. So these are a kind of, uh, you know, finding that we got uh, during the assessment. So one of, one of the problems when uh, kind of, kind of uh, uh, doing a par partnership between high income and low income countries is, you know, there is a kind of perception that, you know, the low income countries for, for us, for example, in, 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 in when we establish in a collaboration with other country, other uh, projects, they feel that, you know, trachoma, communicable disease and something, they were our big issues. But as you can see, you know, almost all cases that we see in Canada in big numbers, we see it in, in, in Ethiopia. So we have a variety of cases. That was really amazing for, for visiting uh, faculties from University of Toronto. At the same time, we had not good, but relatively fair number of uh, uh, staffs in, in the department. So what was the whole purpose? Establish a pediatric ophthalmology fellowship program in, 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 in my university, which will be the first in, in the region, not only for Ethiopia. So what, what we did so far. So as I said, in 2018, you know, a team visited uh, in my institution, situational analysis, a need assessment was conducted and a curriculum is developed. So this uh, uh, pediatric ophthalmology curriculum, it will be a two year duration on site at, at in our hospital. And uh, you know, it has like four modules. And what will be the role of uh, uh, staff from, from UFT? So they will give, be giving uh, lectures, teaching, 
they will be engaged in teaching and they will be engaged in research, uh, advocate, uh, advising research and doing with the staffs and hands-on surgical training. You know, they can come for uh, uh, a week or two or something as uh, Dr. Ali and Tehrani were doing. So you can see that uh, Dr. Uh, Ali, uh, when he was uh, in 2018, he, was, uh, he did some complex case. At the same time, uh, Helen and uh, Asin, they gave uh, CME for uh, uh, Ophthalmological Society of Ethiopia members during their stay. So now Helen is part of us and she is one of a leader of this, the retinoblastoma initiative in, in Ethiopia. So she was engaged in, in the workshop She's helping us in developing this uh, retinoblastoma guideline and the like. And we published our finding in BMC uh, uh, last year. And fortunately we had uh, uh, Tehrani, uh, she visited in 2019. And uh, so what, you know, what we did with uh, uh, Nazra, I mean, uh, Helen, she, 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 she did an amazing job on the retinoblastoma. Nazrin, she helped us to strengthen the ROP screen. And after she visited uh, our centers, now the ROP screening is uh, in a very good shop. Through the, our grant that we got, uh, we have we uh, procured some medical equipment and we changed our lecture home. Helen, maybe you remember the, the lecture hall uh, before, uh, you know, I, I didn't post uh, the lecture hall before, but thanks to our grant, now we have a smart board and we are attending uh, lectures and seminars from the UFT directly, our residents. And uh, uh, so what will be the impact, overall impact of this collaboration? So initially our number were two, but two of my colleagues, they joined us. Now we are four. Uh, and uh, last year, uh, we won a grant of 1 million euro to uh, establish a pediatric eye center at uh, Tukurambas Hospital. And there are programmatic areas which are strengthened after we initiate uh, this, uh, this collaboration. So before uh, this collaboration, before 2018, you know, ROP was, uh, you know, there was no kind of attention for ROP. So now ROP screening is started at uh, the Prambasa and many hospitals and ROP is becoming uh, an issue in, uh, in, our, uh, in our hospital and in our department. And, RB National Technical Team was established. And there is a kind of platform between Sick Kids and Minilik educational platform where residents are benefiting. So as I said, our ROP is a challenge. So we have so many challenges. It was not easy. One of the big challenge was uh, uh, COVID in, in last year, uh, 20, uh, 20, almost we didn't do anything. We had a, uh, we had a plan. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, Stephen Kraft, he had a uh, plan to, to visit us, but unfortunately for COVID reason, we, we couldn't do that. And we were delayed uh, in, uh, you know, uh, uh, endorsing the curriculum of uh, the pediatric fellowship. Uh, we have a challenge in uh, ophthalmic equipment uh, and supply. There is repeat damage of this equipment and shortage of staffs in academic and army. So these are the lesser learned shared benefits. So the, 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 the classical thing was like someone in the, in the collaboration process, you know, here, what we are doing is like, you know, people from Canada is not only giving something, but I feel that they are taking something too. So individual driven initiatives can bring a change. It's another lesson that we learn. Need assessment helps to us improve where the gap is. The existing collaboration helps us to strengthen education service and the academic institution from developing countries like us should utilize the resources in collaboration. So here are the next steps, finalize the curriculum, strengthen the e-learning and collaborate in research and, and projects. And uh, I thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Sharif. That was a great comprehensive presentation. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Otiti next, who will tell us uh, about her work in Uganda. Mm 
Thank you very much for this opportunity to meet with you. Let me just put this on slide show. Okay, my name is uh, Dr. Juliet Otisi, and um, and I'm here to talk to you to to give you a brief about our collaboration with the University of Toronto. I am the chair of the Department of Ophthalmology at Macquarie University. Uh, Macquarie University is based at a hospital called Mulago Hospital, which is in the capital city of Uganda. Uganda is in East Africa. The department has been in existence for ophthalmology res residency training for over 40 years. You know that the history in Uganda is we've had a bit of civil war and unrest. So the department has had very, very slow growth over the years, but we are now beginning to grow. Our resident intake used to be very low, maybe three to six in total, but now we have 20, over 20 over the past five years. And we get residents from not only from Uganda, but from our neighboring countries, Kenya, Tanzania, South Sudan, Somalia, Rwanda, and Burundi. Our residency program is, runs for only three years at the moment. Uh, Uganda has a population of maybe about 40, 42 million people, and we still have a very low number of ophthalmologists, about 40, and only eight of them have had a fellowship or gone into sub-specialization, and some of those who have specialized are actually beginning to retire. So we have a, a young generation of young doctors who are eager to learn and specialize and get the discipline moving forward. So how did the collaboration start? This is a picture of me attending, uh, when I was a very young resident, attending um, a session with the Obis Flying Eye Hospital when they came to Uganda. And that's how it started. I was so inspired that I wanted to do more. When we were doing our residency, we were only doing extra cup. We'd not seen anything that happens in the developed world. And in those days, there was even no internet. So getting access to what happens in the developed world was impossible. So that was in about 2007, Obis came and I was, I, I, we did, I did my first corneal transplant with the Obis team and I was really desperate to learn more and be able to introduce corneal surgery in Uganda. Okay, sorry about that. Sorry about that. So I had, I had the opportunity to have an Obis sponsored fellowship in Tilganga, Nepal. And that's where I observed the impact of the positive impact of having collaborations in a resource limited setting. And that's when I met, I was inspired by mentors. I met Dr. Rui, Dr. Rita. Then I met some staff from the University of Toronto, Dr. Jeff Tabin. And that's where I met Dr. Mark Bujak. At that time, I wasn't even a member of the department, the teaching department. I was just working in the government hospital. I'd not yet made up my mind to join the teaching institution at that time. But I spoke with them and said, we need more of this in Uganda. How can you come and partner with us so that we can also improve the way we do things back at home? And everyone had a bit of a, was interested in exploring the possibility. So we, I chatted with Dr. Bujak, Dr. Mark Bujak at that time. And then we discussed what the needs would be between the two departments. And um, we, we, we expressed that the collaboration would support uh, the Macquarie residents gaining exposure and training and advances in latest techniques in ophthalmology. And then in the same way, we'd be able to invite University of Toronto residents to come and experience ophthalmology practice in a resource limited setting and specifically learn small incision cataract surgery. Okay, so our purpose was to broaden the exposure of the resident program in the two faculties through having uh, surgical camps in Uganda. And we thought we would do one camp in Kampala, which would be more specialized where you have access to better equipment. And uh, because I was interested in cornea 
and Matt was a cornea, was, was also interested in cornea, would do cornea surgeries in Kampala and then have a rural outreach setting, uh, a rural outreach camp where we'd have exposure to, to, to small incision cataract surgery and other surgeries. And in the process during the two week period, we'd have teachings and exchange of skills, interaction with the staff from University of Toronto, and that would be able to fulfill our purpose. So we plan to have two visits every year. The first visit was in 2013 with Dr. Bujak, where we had we did some corneal transplants and, and did a small incision cataract surgery camp. Then he came again in 2015 and 2017, we went to Kavale, which is in Western Uganda. And then in 2019, Dr. Fariba came to see and visit us, but uh, COVID, the COVID situation came, came and we couldn't have any, plan any activity. So the main outcomes were the cataract surgery comes. We've done every time we had a visit, we do about up to about 150 surgeries. The corneal surgery, surgery comes as well. Matt would be, would, and I would go and do corneal transplant awareness campaigns on radio about eye banking because we're still in the process of trying to start an eye bank in Uganda. Then we'd have teaching and clinical sessions. And then recently, which was a, a very a good improvement is the access to the Zoom resident teachings, which has helped us a lot. The residents love them. So these are some images of how we, of Matt coming and these are residents going through a teaching session, some of the patients that came in. Um, then this is another one when we went to Kavale and uh, they were setting up the, the operation table and you, you can see students from, the residents from Toronto giving some lectures and participating in the activities. We had exposure to new techniques. Um, this is a patient we was able to do a DSEC on with Matt for sort of fecicular keratopathy. And um, so the key challenges are just having enough financial support for these activities. It's still, it's not enough. Then of course, working in a developing country, there are always unexpected setbacks because we, we would plan these missions a year in advance, but there's always something that comes up that you hadn't planned for. So you always need a plan A, plan B. Then administrative support in coordinating all these activities, managing the large volumes of patients, especially in the rural camps. Then right now the travel restrictions due to COVID, we cannot have any more outreach programs happening. And lastly, maybe internet uh, reliability for the Zoom sessions. So this is an image that shows the big need. Patients would wait in line and even fall asleep in line and on the right hand corner, you see Matt very tired, trying to clear the lines of patients. And the expectation when you go to a rural setting is that you must be able to do all the patients that come to the camp. And if you're there for only five days, it's, it's quite challenging to be able to finish large numbers. Would work till very late hours in the night. You can see Matt trying to do a pre-op assessment so that we can continue with the next and the next and the next. And then we'd have to handle emergencies as well, look for general anesthesia as well in the rural setting. So the plans, we want to establish an equitable collaboration with specific rural sites so that we're in more control of our activities. We'd like to start, we'd like, we'd like to, to encourage our young doctors to have some fellowships and we want to focus on squint management, pediatric ophthalmology. We want to start a diabetic retinopathy service in our department. We hope we can have exchange programs and also develop a glaucoma fellowship in our department. Thank you for listening. It's always a happy ending when you come over. We are really grateful for everything that you've done to support us. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Otiti. Uh, we'll move on to Dr. Esteman for our final um, talk and then we'll open for discussion. So um, 
It's good afternoon here. Good afternoon, everyone. And good to have this presentation. This will be the outline of my presentation. And thank you, Helen, for the introduction. So I will skip a lot of this. But just to say that I actually work with the University of Ghana Medical School. And I also practice as a pediatric ophthalmologist for our premier hospital in the country, that is Kolibu Teaching Hospital, where I had the pediatric ophthalmology unit. So my country is in the Western part of Africa and I, I practice in Ghana, in the capital city, which is Accra. Ghana has a, pop, a population of about 30 million people and less 40% uh, of this population is aged less than 16 years and with a birth rate of about 800,000 a year. We became low middle income country um, a few years ago. Sometimes we are not sure whether we are low middle income country or we are a developing country, but I think either way we settle for that. And the city in which I work has a population of about 4 million people. So the partnership with University of uh, Toronto, this partnership was aimed at establishing a national strategy for retinoblastoma in my country, help develop research uh, capacity for us, and then training, especially clinical care in retinoblastoma. The purpose, just as I said, included this. And I think our main ones were to, at the end of it, ensure that we establish a comprehensive national strategy for retinoblastoma in Ghana. And we knew that Canada or sick kids were, I mean, was the the good uh, model for us to really learn from because they had helped Kenya to est establish a national program. We also wanted to ensure that through this partnership, we will develop standard operating procedures, especially for retinoblastoma and for other conditions and explore other co training collaboration where there'll be exchanges between our students in uh, the students of Un University of Toronto. So how did the partnership develop? I've been talking about retinoblastoma establishing a national program. So in Ghana, retinoblastoma actually happens to be the commonest intraocular tumor for all, um, in my department. And most of the children present with late disease, both clinically and histopathologically. It accounts for, it is actually the third childhood malignancy in Kolebu Teaching Hospital by published data. And overall, we see between 55 and 65 children with retinoblastoma a year across the country. The problem is that with these numbers, anecdotally, the overall survival is less than 50%. In fact, in 2010, our survival was around 20%. There has been some improvement, but it is still less than 50%. Coupled with this is the fact that we do not have a comprehensive uh, center, a center for comprehensive management of retinoblastoma in the country. We also do not have any national guidelines or program for retinoblastoma management and funding has been a challenge. Even though we have a national health insurance scheme, it covers, it doesn't cover um, a lot of the things related to retinoblastoma. So in 2017, something happened. We have been losing children, but there was one child in particular that we lost to retinoblastoma. We had diagnosed at the age of six months with bilateral retinoblastoma. We removed one eye because it was advanced. The second eye had just a solitary tumor, which needed focal treatment, but which was not available in the country and they could not raise funds to go out. So 
we gave full, I mean, 12 cycles of chemo, which was unusual. And after that, we couldn't continue. The long and short of it is that we removed the second eye at the age of 13 months and enrolled this child. The child was enrolled into the blind school at the age of five years. And that was January, 2017. Because of funding issue, we could not follow this child up with any neuroimaging during the period. Then six months down the line, that was in August, the child came in with seizures and died in hospital. And that sparked something in us that enough of the losses due to retinoblastoma. So we needed to do something. We had been talking about establishing a national program, but we, I mean, we hadn't actually made much uh, strides in that sense. So about that month, I heard about the One Retinoblastoma World Conference that was taking place in Washington, DC. So I said that I had to go to this conference. And that I believe I will meet leaders in retinal to establish this program. So Himalayan Katrat project sponsored me to this conference. And that is how the collaboration started. Luckily, we met uh, Lona is my the pediatric oncologist in my hospital. And the two of us met Dr. Helen Demaras and Dr. Brenda Gali. So we, and you can see me in the picture at the back there. And we had discussions and which led to um, the request for them to assist us, which they were very happy to do that. And fast forward, they, through their help and especially Dr. Demaras, um, they arranged for, uh, uh, for me to come to Toronto Sick Kids as a research collaborator and then also as a clinical observer, one to help develop, in this case, a draft strategy. I wanted to understand the Canadian program, also do a literature search on national programs across the world that was available and see how the Canadian program um, was working. So that was my research during the period, which I worked with Dr. Dimaras on that. And I also worked with Dr. Brenda to actually look at how they managed retinoblastoma programs, the tumor board meetings, et cetera. So the year 2018 actually was, a, and you can see that um, I had a certificate to show that I have had this training. And of course, in theater with Dr. Brenda, which really has helped me and my country greatly in the care of children with retinoblastoma. So just the goals for the project in terms of what we started doing was to actually improve the medical care of children with retinoblastoma nationwide, mobilize resources, conduct collaborative research and monitor this work. And our aim is that by the time the strategy is established, we should be able to improve on survival to 80% in five years. We are still working on that. So what has been the achievement so far? And I must say that um, Dr. Demaras and Dr. Brenda, they have still worked with us in, in this uh, stride. Now we have a draft national strategy that has been developed, awaiting review and adoption by a national stakeholder team. A national baseline survey for retinoblastoma is underway. It's almost complete. And thus, uh, Dr. Demaras is a co-PI with me. And we are working with other colleagues across the country, trying to look at the number of patients with the disease, the stage of the disease, the referral pathways, patient outcomes, and also assess the institutional capacity across the country for retinoblastoma management. The other important thing is that a national red cap database, which is housed by my university, that's the University of Ghana, and it is housed by the University of Ghana, has been established. And we are piloting, that is the database that we are using to record retrospective data. But we are also piloting this database to serve as 
R registry for retinoblastoma going forward. And we are doing this with prospective data uh, entry, and this is ongoing. This has also been this capacity uh, development and in retinoblastoma care. And now my center is able to provide care. No child is going out of the country to other parts of the world as we used to do in the past. Now we are able to offer laser treatment. And even recently, apart from South Africa and Egypt, we are now offering intra-arterial chemotherapy in my center and brachytherapy will be coming on board this year. There has also been, we've had a number of uh, grant applications. I must say that they haven't been successful, but I would say partly successful because it has taught some of us how to write grants and how to go up. And I know that very soon, some of the ones that are in the pipeline, we may be successful with that. And that has been a great achievement for us. Of course, the challenges have been the limited sources of funding. Um, of course, this has slowed down progress in the development of the national agenda. Now with the financial management in my country, um, programs that are planned require a number of years to be captured in national budget lines. And so that slowed down things a bit, but we've, and we've covered a lot of grounds where this program has become a national program accepted by the non-communicable disease and then also the I division of the Ministry of Health. So it is part of the program. Of course, COVID-19 pandemic has had a big blow on us. It has not affected the management of the children, but in terms of other programs like the, our national stakeholder meeting, we were expecting doctors uh, Demaras and Gali to have visited Ghana last year for our stakeholder meeting, but that couldn't come on because of COVID. We are hoping that we can have it partly virtual and partly um, in person, maybe June or July this year. So that has also delayed the implementation of the full strategy. So what are the next steps for us? We are hoping that we will have the national stakeholder meeting, continue with the capacity building where we will continue with um, telemedicine in this case, establish it firmly so that we can discuss our difficult cases in retinoblastoma with the sick uh, kids group or retinoblastoma group. We also want to continue with the research collaboration. And this time we had actually developed proposals to look at the genetics of retinoblastoma. And then in this case, start a tumor collection for this. The work has been done and we want, we are hoping that we can put this through when we get the appropriate grant to support that. Of course, uh, last not, but not the least is to explore in the near future, the capacity building in partnership, especially for both undergraduates and graduate level for, because I believe that now in developed countries, we have the data, we have the numbers of the patients but we need collaboration with higher centers like U of T so that we can develop um, capacity for both um, our students and at the same time also come up with um, cutting edge research that will improve on the lot of our people. I want to thank you so much for giving us an opportunity to showcase what we are doing, especially with the help of U of T um, in this area. But for the help that you gave us, I'm sure our dream of establishing a national program would have still remained a dream. But now it is something which is a reality. And I believe that very soon we will start the implementation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vera. And thank you very much to all our panelists. Uh, I'm afraid as moder moderator, I haven't done a good job of keeping us on time to leave uh, enough time for discussion. Um, do we have a few minutes to maybe ask one question, Amandeep, or? I didn't hear what you said. I think it's fine. Nothing to okay. so off right away. Um, yes, we do. We, we have great. a couple minutes, but we have teaching in about 15 minutes. So okay, we will... great. Maybe um, as people get their questions together, I'll ask one to our panelists. Um, you are all very complimentary in the role of U of T in supporting your programs, for which you have um, shown quite uh, outstanding leadership. I wonder, um, my interest is in learning from failures. I wonder what the biggest challenge you found in working with international partners. Uh, maybe give us some advice that we could learn from. 
Anybody want to take a stab at this one first? Maybe I want to start. Sure. I want to say that um, maybe the, one of the biggest challenge has been not with U of T, but generally where sometimes the relationship or the partnership is like, um, maybe I, I can't get the correct word to use, but pardon me, but where it's like um, a child and a parent sort of, you know, instead of partners. And in this case, we are not able to, we are not given, should I say, the necessary room to work as a partner. So sometimes you do a lot of work, but um, you don't sometimes get that recognition. I will say that I haven't experienced that with U of T, but I'm hoping that this partnership with us will not go along such lines. And I also want to say that usually our problem is actually winning uh, grants. And I would say that that is one of the things that we need from, from you or I mean your institution to partner with us and help us to, in this case, get appropriate grants that will help our, our work. Thank you, Vera. Sadek? Yeah, so the, the, the major, to me, the major challenges regarding building these sustainable partnerships are, you know, either as uh, uh, Vera said rightly, you know, it's a kind of collaboration, but you may export your uh, your curriculum, or you may export your your teachers from the, and you may import uh, students to the to to the. So all of them they have exporting and importing. It has its own things, and uh, as uh, Vera said, though it is a resource limited uh, uh, area that uh, we are working, but I feel that we have something to give. Uh, something to share, uh, you know, in terms uh, regarding, uh, you know, improving the quality of care. Uh, you know, nowadays, look, COVID, what, what has done to the global? So global health is a big issue for, for all of us. So, you know, we, there are things that uh, uh, we can learn. Uh, I mean, those, those uh, uh, seniors and uh, mentors in that sector, at the same time, staff here they can learn so it's a kind of mutual shared shared uh, responsibility in that way we can make it uh, sustainable thank you um dr maud or dr ott anything to add i just want to echo what's been said and in terms of challenges as um dr esuman had said it's not on your part the challenges are really more so on our part with the resources and certainly having the partnership with you has certainly helped with advocacy for improving things in ophthalmology in the residency program. And it's been a great experience. Um, we've learned a lot and there's still a lot more to learn. I also want to see how we can do shared benefits. I know that um, Sharif and myself have spoken a lot about the possibility of um, interactions with the residents coming down or lectures coming down and um, because there are things that probably you, your residents don't get a chance to do much of in terms of trauma, in terms of um, ekis, that sort of thing, that they could get a little bit of experience or a little exposure with that. Because I think it's important that there's always a benefit on both sides of a partnership. Thank you. Um, are there any other questions from others here? Glenn, if I could just say one thing, I, I commend you on your question about what are the challenges but I think it's good to end on a positive note. All the things that we've built, and I commend you on uh, these rounds across the world. And I think we've started the journey with education uh, and Zoom, actually COVID has made that, hasn't made it possible, but it's pointed us in the direction of using digital and Zoom to um, be able to share knowledge and share our experiences and share our knowledge. And I think, formats like this really promote further development. And it's good to hear what are the challenges, but also on a positive note, uh, we are making headway and we are uh, hoping to be able to learn from our partners and have them learn from us. 
so we, I think we have to wrap it up just in the interest of time. There were some questions uh, from the audience, but uh, I think they are going to take longer than we have. It's uh, resident teaching, but I just want to thank you very much, Helen, and uh, to your entire group of panelists. I think this was a truly amazing discussion. It's uh, great to see uh, the international partnership flourishing uh, here between U of T <coughs> and all of you. I do want to remind our residents that we actually, uh, well, at least in the post-COVID world, we actually have uh, uh, grants and funding for those who would like to uh, find ways to participate. And I thank you, Lizette, for mentioning, you know, the experience can work both ways. We would be delighted to uh, uh, explore ed uh, resident edu educational opportunities in that regard. So thank you very much, all of you. And I just have to put in uh, one more plug. Uh, I put it up in the chat. We have our Toronto Cataract course tomorrow, hosted by Ike Ahmed and M&D Bry. Uh, it is free this year and virtual, um, but you do have to register. The link is in the, the chat box, and it's also available uh, in your email from Sandra as part of the, uh, uh, the uh, weekly events uh, reminder email. Uh, we have no grand rounds next week because it was to be March break. Of course, that's all cancelled, but <clears throat> too late to put someone on the agenda. So enjoy your pseudo March break next week. And thank you very much to all speakers for taking the time to speak with us this morning. Fantastic work you're doing. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, take thank care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.